66 million years from now, dinosaurs ruled the surface of planet Earth. But in the blink of an eye, this dynasty would fall to a mass extinction. And out of all things, the mammals would take their place. But eventually, 80 million years ago, a devastating catastrophe wiped out 57% of all life on Earth. This extinction event was caused by a worldwide supervolcanic activity. Volcanic activity could easily wipe out 57% of all life on the planet, thrusting toxic gases into the atmosphere and blocking out the sun for years on end. But the end could easily be the beginning, because for every mass extinction, something has to take their place, and some of the most adapted species are perfect for these conditions. This documentary takes place 80 million years from now. The planet is quite different. Much of the planet is much warmer, with a higher sea level and oxygen content. This has allowed evolution to take hold and run wild. Humans are not present in this narrative, either having left the planet or long since died out. British Columbia, 80 million years from now. This dense temperate grassland of women's thriving land of British Columbia. Brand new species have evolved in these new transcontinental regions. Species we, we wouldn't recognize today. This massive creature is what's known as a monorat. Despite looking like a yak or a bison, it is descended from neither, and is actually descended from the common brown rat. Rats are quite adaptable animals, so they can adapt to many different niches left on the planet after a mass extinction. Unlike ungulates, they are solitary animals, only getting together during rutting season. The horns are also comprised of keratin, so they grow back easily once they are cut. While the male browses for food, you can notice a small, sharp tooth. It is developed from the incisors of the rat, and is used mainly to dig up roots and other succulents it feeds on. While it may be the largest land mammal in North America, it is certainly not the only herbivore. These are rabaroos, specifically of the temperate variety. These creatures may look and hop like the extinct kangaroos of Earth's past, but are actually the descendants of animals such as jackrabbits. They are extremely successful and thrive here in North America. They love the grasslands and forest because there is plenty to eat. This is a male communicating with his mate. They communicate by simple gestures and sounds. They are strictly monogamous, mating for life. However, they don't have a pouch like the kangaroos, so they raise their young in burrows. There's a sound! The top predator in the North American grasslands and forests are the coyote. They are roughly the size of the extinct wolf, however are descended from coyotes. This old female is the matriarch. She is the leader of her pack and has experienced the most hunts in her lifetime. They are the top predators of the Rabaroos, since they are so widespread across the areas they live in. Wetlands, forests, grasslands, and tundras are all places coyotes dwell. Meanwhile, the male has returned to his mate, unharmed and full. However, now she is hungry. A hotter environment has led to a mix of trees and grasslands, 
lush grazing for smaller animals and browsing for larger animals. Perfect for herbivores. She looks like a kangaroo. Rabaroos fill the niches of deer and elk. Since the North American continent collided with Africa, deer moved down south, leaving the North American continent completely. There's something going on. She can feel it. Her nose is twitching and her ears are down. That means she's sensing danger. She notices her senses are still bothering her, even if she's at the pond, away from the danger. Despite her senses, she continues eating. It's a mitopia. A large dinosaur-like creature that lurks in swamps around the world. This is a North American variant, and is the top predator. She doesn't see him, and her ears are flopped, muffling her hearing. However, he is now full. In the swamp canopy, a forest shrew who dwells. It lives in the trees and swamps of the forest, and features a lengthy snout to capture insects, which are its primary food source. It lives like a primate, but is descended from shrews. They hunt for small insects and other invertebrates up in the canopy, using their bizarre drunk trunks to grip prey. However, the female Rabaru is in danger. A predator is near, and this time, it actually is hungry. This is a bear fisher. It is a solitary hunter, and is part of a large family known as Mustelids. It is the same size as the extinct grizzly bear, but it's not related to them. Since the Rabaroos are fast moving, it has its work cut out in trying to catch her. But he is an ambush predator, and relies on power rather than speed. It has her. Right in the tail. Coming in at a whopping 400 pounds, he is one of the largest terrestrial predators in the future world. Back near the burrow, the male senses something is quite wrong. This is a male tree eater. While today armadillos live in the US and Mexico, along with other continents, they are quite successful in North America to the point where they've spread to Canada and have grown to be truly enormous. His long digging claws are used for digging or stripping bark off of trees, almost like the extinct ground sloths or dinosaurs or of Therizinosaurus of old. It uses its long prehensile tongue to feed on the needles of the pine tree it feeds on. In the temperate regions, there is less to eat so it has moved to a solely herbivorous diet. While this monorat grazes for food, both herbivores ignore each other. As he feeds, he occasionally swallows small insects by accident. In the nearby wetlands, the clawed goose hunts for fish using its toothy beak and balancing on its platform-like feet, while it grips onto prey using its flightless clawed wings. While they are descended from Canada geese, they are flightless and are no longer migratory. Another animal specialized for wetland environments is the trivet. 
A distant relative of the Mara Rat also descended from the Black Rat. However, it now lives a lifestyle similar to otters or seals, an excellent example of divergent evolution. Both creatures are related, but fill very different niches. They are quite well adapted for their respective niche with their webbed feet and thick oily fur. However, they face competition from a newly evolving competitor. The competitor is the sea mink. They are very close descendants of the American mink, but resemble sea lions. They are completely piscivorous and fill a similar niche to the trimming, putting them both in competition. As we delve into the great autumn forest, a truly unique species lurks. It is the wood shrew. It has a bipedal stance and resembles the Silurosaurs of the Jurassic period. However, it is descended from the Dusky Shrew, and feeds mainly on small mammals or lizards of the forest. While it has a bizarre stance, this body plan is now becoming much more common. They are very speedy runners and come in many different colorations, but all eventually turn white in the winter. They are quite small, being about the size of the extinct Scottish Wildcat. Unlike its arboreal relatives, the wood shrew is strictly a carnivore. It feeds on rodents, small amphibians, reptiles, and carrion. And while the wood shrew is common, other animals live in these coniferous forests, some of which would be recognizable today. Modern birds are still relatively common. Birds such as this blue jay thrive in the temperate woodlands, feeding on nuts and insects. In the forest, the female Rabaroo takes a small drink. The sun is setting, and she needs to be quick and swift as she doesn't want to end up at someone's lunch. She is attacked by the Mychopia. Thankfully, she escaped. Mychopia is the apex predator. And despite looking like a tyrannosaur, it is descended from the tiger salamander, but is a good example of what happens when an amphibian convergently evolves the evolutionary predator niche of the T-Rex. It is also a hibernator, and cold blooded. Before he hibernates, he needs to find enough food to store for the winter, before he finally submerges himself in the water for the entire winter. This younger male, however, has brought down a mono rat. Mytopia has the most powerful bite force in the temperate woodlands, and with the added features of being found in most environments, makes them effective predators in this world. Afterwards, the Rabaru pair are bonding. They happen to be very social animals, which is why they mate for life, which can be pretty long, since these animals are capable of living for 40 to 55 years which is pretty long in rabbit terms, and especially in rodent terms. One of the more prehistoric looking species is the air lizard. This is a temperate variant. Once they were originally only endemic to Thailand. However, they were so successful, they spread across the globe. However, the temperate variants are migratory. The mono rat, on the other hand, is not migratory. Autumn is the rutting season for them, and they store specialized fat deposits, which allow them to go without food for a long period. This male is rather elderly, so he doesn't have the need to go into rut, and it is only common amongst younger males. This younger male, however, is definitely going to be a rat, meaning he is willing to breed. While modern-day rats don't have a breeding season, after the extinction of most North American ungulates, they have evolved a breeding season and now go through rut. This breeding season lasts from mid-fall to early winter. And while you can see, the old male clearly doesn't have time for this. But the younger male clearly does. It will take 
take a week for the horns to grow back. In that time frame, the loser will be unable to fight for a mate. As night falls, smaller nocturnal creatures arise to feed and play. Among the bizarre night animals is the squilly. The squilly is a flying bat and is most active at night. They feast on small insects and other mammals. Despite their canid-like snout, they are most closely related to the little brown bats. Absolutely adorable creatures. Despite being very small, they are rather big by bat standards. They are about the same size as a house cat. Among the forest floor, we found the bat hunter. It is a nocturnal predator descended from the humble opossum. It is also semi-arboreal, which it uses its prehensile tail to climb along the trees to catch its principal prey, which are the bats. The bat hunter has her work cut out in trying to catch one. The night is quite serene and calm, with very little predators. That's why the squillies are so peaceful and slow. Once the sun rises, the squillies retreat to their caves, where they are no longer vulnerable. And the bat hunters are still active during the day. To conserve energy, they take frequent naps. During the winter months, it is extremely cold. The bear fisher has a special adaptation. During winter, it changes its coloration to white, similar to the extinct polar bears of Earth's past. It uses this coloration to blend in with its surroundings. The bear fisher are most docile during the winter, and due to the store that and they've gathered in summer, there's no need to attack. The winter, however, is extremely tough and bitter. The wood shrews live in large groups for a reason. During winter, some predators hunt them almost daily. This is the catasaur. While today, domestic cats live mostly in our homes, feral cats run wild. These are the descendants of feral domestic cats who are able to evolve into multiple new forms, all beautifully adapted for killing. However, they are certainly smaller than most predators in the temperate forest which means they are scavengers rather than apex predators. While they struggle here, their cousins are running wild in the rainforest of Asia and Africa. The mother Rabaru doesn't appreciate the small male trying to eat her baby. Food is scarce this time of year. For herbivores, they might have to rely, rely on something truly revolting. They may have to rely on coprophagia for the entirety of winter. Poop is nutritious and will last them both the entire winter. The tribits are hibernators. They go underwater and burrow into the thick mud and sleep throughout the entire winter. Even the beginning of spring is still tough and hard to survive for most animals. The Mychopia hibernates for the entirety of winter, and in early spring, its metabolism is completely shut down. It's barely conscious, and while the tropical Mychopia don't hibernate, the temperate variety goes through a long hibernation. Being cold-blooded, it is also completely sluggish during the winter. 
with the arrival of spring, the microdon thrives in the springtime weather, searching for roots and other succulents they feast on. Their quills have become fused and matted, like the horns of the extinct rhinoceros of the Anthropocene. Despite resembling an armadillo, it is actually the descendant of the North American porcupine. During the early spring months, the leaf toad has a strange worm-like tail to lure in rodents, which are its primary food source. Once it finally finds its prey, it lunges forward with surprising speed. After March and April, May arrives, and the snow melts completely. While the summer months are much more lush and warm, the spring months are very warm and give rise to lush fern prairies. And during spring, the herbivores thrive, however some are truly enormous. Some grow to the point where they dwarf even the mono rat. But what are these? We're about to find out. This is a Torah Titan. The largest terrestrial vertebrate alive. This one hasn't even reached his full potential yet, but he is about the size of the extinct African elephants. Truly a titan, but his parents are much, much bigger. The Toraton way the Tora Titan weighs 114 tons and dwarfs even the monorat. They are descendants of the leopard tortoise and live in herds led by a monogamous couple. They thrive in all sorts of environments from tropical rainforests to temperate woodlands. Spring is their breeding season and they can live up to 90 or 100 years old. This is the telling of a new tale. The Anthropocene is finally over. In the next episode, we shall explore the icy, wind-swept tundra of Alaska. Explore how each species is adapted to, to this frozen environment. See how apex predators have adapted to life in the Antarctic Sea. And witness how the greatest journeys in the animal kingdom are the ones we will never see. It's been over seven months of winter in the Alaskan wilderness, and times have been tough, but it is finally over. And for most animals, it's exactly what they've been waiting for. Alaska, 80 million years from now. This tundra is in the area of Alaska. While most of the polar ice caps have melted, Alaska has recovered from the human era and has regained most of its ice. Temperatures here are absolutely extreme. After the North American continent collided with Africa, 
European and Asian creatures were able to migrate to North America. However, animals such as polar bears, yaks, muskoxen, walruses, snow leopards, orcas, and timber wolves are long extinct. However, evolution has created replacements for them, creatures we wouldn't recognize. This strange snow leopard creature is a Gorath. Despite its appearance, it is much closely descended from the humble Weasley, least weasel. Its coloration is camouflaged to hunt its prey. During the winter months, the females will leave the tundra for prey, while the males stay. This one is the king of this untamed land, and his name is Storm. However, these are two young sisters, and they want his crown. Unlike the other females, they've never left for food. Instead, they've stayed here. Instincts tell them that that way, all the remaining food will be for themselves. While the Alaskan summer on its own is very warm and nice, it only lasts for three months. Ahead lie seven months of bitterly cold winter. <laughs> the principal prey of the Gorath is the Lemo a migratory species descended from the Norway lemming. However, they aren't much bigger than sheep. The herd is led by one dominant male. They resemble hippos to an extent and are semi-aquatic, but unlike hippos, they are docile and peaceful, using their long claws to dig up roots. Since the summer is short, mating season is very quick and happens throughout each summer. Whenever they return from south, they put their incisors into good use. Meanwhile, Storm relaxes on the riverbank. This riverbank is his territory. Currently, he is resting, but he needs to keep watch. He's well aware that the siblings want his crown. This area of Alaska is very near the high mountains. Many mountain dwellers live in these forests and high elevation areas. The plateau is where a truly unique creature lurks. The piebald mammoth deer is a deer and is one of the few ungulates still in existence. The mammoth deer are a most diverse group of ungulates. Unlike the white-tailed deer they evolved from, they are solitary and only get together for mating. This old male is looking for food. They feature a trunk-like snout and use it to access food. Despite the lack of plants acting as cover, the piebald mammoth deer thrive in the mountains. This male is 34 years old. Quite old, but still quite healthy. He is attacked by the saber-toothed fox, his only predator in these mountains. However, she is not going to give up so easily. Right in the throat. She finally has a meal. She may seem fierce, but she is actually a descendant of the arctic fox. Convergently, she has evolved saber teeth, a lethal predator or that makes her, and is also a lethal weapon that some feline predators have already used. <laughs> Storm is still on his riverbank. His young are both males, and spend most of their time cuddling and licking each other. They also like playing with their father. The siblings, however, have never mated. They want his territory, and that's the first step they have, taking Storm out of the picture. But we'll have to wait until winter. And just like that, after a few months, the summer season is replaced with a bitterly cold fall. 
the once lush landscape has transformed. It seems Storm and his children don't seem to care. The winter has always been a minor problem. However, bigger problems are on the horizon. It's one of the sisters. In his mind, this should be easy. He takes the first bite, right in the head. However, what he didn't know is that this was an ambush. Exhausted and bleeding, Storm has given up. His territory is theirs for the taken. These strange creatures are beavers. It resembles a walrus, but the walruses have long since gone. They are descended from the American beaver. The reason for their tusk is the fact that they are in developed from incisors. And flying in the sky are the flipper birds. Small flying fish descended from the gliding flying fish of today. The colonies are led by an adult male, called a bull. The bull is the father of each calf, and the mate of each female. Weighing a thousand and five hundred kilos, he doesn't exactly scream ideal male to take on. The flipper birds and beavers have a strange relationship. The bull produces a massive amount of fecal matter, which in high doses would make the beaver sick. So the flipper birds feed on the massive amounts of fecal matter produced by the bull. In return, the bull doesn't attack. Underwater, the beavers feed on a large variety of shrimp. The Arctic seas are filled with variety. The megatooth shark filters food. It is the new largest fish on the planet. But it is harmless. Far less harmless is the killer seal. After the extinction of most ocean fauna, these creatures evolved to rule the oceans. It's seals who are the dominant marine mammals now. As the beaver relaxes on an ice floe, she is in grave danger. The only way out is in the dark waters of below, but the seal is not going to give up so easily. Storm wanders through the Al Alpine, away from the sea. His prey are migrating, and the beavers are not his principal prey. They can easily one-shot him with those tusks. The horned marmot is a very large rhinoceros-like creature. It uses its single horn for defense, and feeds off moss and lichen. For Storm, despite being hungry, it's just simply not worth the injury. The sun sets for the final time on the horizon. The Alaskan wilderness is going through a bitterly tough winter. Thankfully, the aurora shimmering in the sky provides a way for the limo. They are heading for the hot springs. However, the young are always quick to fall prey. <laughs> the kill is quick, but the meat is fresh. He watches the herd move on without concern. distant relative of the bear fisher and uh, to an extent him. However, it doesn't want him. It wants his kill. He knows better to, than to stay. With teeth designed to grip flesh, he is the perfect meat eater. The horned marmots are also migrating. 
these animals are herbivores that are extremely dangerous. It's the hot springs, the only refuge during the winter. However, back home, the sisters have both eaten Storm's offspring. This just goes to show their presence on the ice sheets. It's a hand flapper. This one seems unafraid of them, but they should be afraid of it. It's not much, but the Simpsons will show soon. On the frozen shores, the flightless tern searches for food. They mainly prey on fish in the cold waters. However, the flipper birds are also a good source of food. To prevent their populations from getting too big, the flightless terns are in turn hunted by the snow dragon. As Storm hunts, the lemos are absolutely no pushovers. With their long incisors and huge claws, they are not easy prey. However, he knows a new tactic. Go for the throat. The Lemo may be large, but Storm and his new tactic can easily overpower them. Near the ice sheets, the Tyrannovarine hunts for food. This niche was formerly held by polar bears, but after the mass extinction, bears eventually became extinct. The Tyrannovarine fills this niche now, but the seal rats is the principal prey of the Tyrannovarine and he knows exactly when they need to rise to get air. <laughs> Grabbing a flipper bird from the air is the giant octo killer, a large descendant of the giant octopus that is now the apex predator of the frozen ocean. It has given up its intellect for strength, using its powerful tentacles for gripping flying birds and bats. It is also one of the few octopi that has given up its ability to move on land. The Tyrannovarine is the only creature on the planet it fears. But both predators fear and respect each other. As Storm wanders, some of the, the encounters with herbivores are quite surprising. It's a panda alligator. It is the only herbivorous crocodilian. Like the now extinct panda bears, they are very energetic and are actually quite slow. Also, they are now warm-blooded to exploit the little energy they can get in this tundra. However, their enormous jaws and teeth are lethal. However, this female couldn't care less about Storm. They would have been perfectly at home in the age of the dinosaurs. And this really isn't the best environment for them. In fact, their tooth shape and digestive system are designed to eat meat. They'd way be more at home in the tropical forest. The hot springs are very strange indeed. The winter is almost ending, and for the herbivores, it tells them that the hot spring is getting cooler, and that their home will be warm. The Tyrannovarine is being attacked, but not by another predator, but by a parasite. The Bat Squirrel is a sanguinous rodent descended from the humble Red Squirrel. Its diet consists of the blood of other animals. They are about the smallest mammal in the New World, and they need to be this small enough to be noticed by their host. Unlike mosquitoes, it's not harmful, but God is it annoying! The mammoth deer travel on their own to the mountain. Every year they do this. They also have to cross a lake. They are strong swimmers, 
but the lake is lined with predators. They all stand, reluctant to go in. But they have to go in. Storm and the deer are good swimmers. But that's not the problem here. It'll take a few minutes, but those minutes are quite dangerous. Most of the swimmers are making it, but the predator is waiting for his chance. It's an old male, the perfect opportunity. An elderly male is attacked by a flightless bird known simply as the fish bird, a fully aquatic bird that hunts the mammoth deer every year. It's a truly awful way to start summer. During spring, only one female remains. But she is also severely weak. The perfect opportunity for Storm. As she tries to look big, Storm seizes his chance. You should have gone for the throat. Once again, he is the king of this untamed land. Some ignore it, some fear it, most see it as a warning sign. But that is not the only triumph. This is a pegotite, a large filter feeding penguin, the largest animal of all time, and the new largest animal on planet Earth. This female is a mother traveling with her baby. These birds fill the niches left by the now extinct whales and dolphins, and they are truly enormous. With their huge bodies and high body fat, they are perfectly at home here. episode, we shall explore the northern coniferous forest of Nova Scotia, explore how each species is adapted to this lush environment. Find out which predator is the most efficient, and discover the magic and beauty in this truly untamed land.
like trees steam in the morning temperatures, and the chorus of birds and other animals fills the air. Unlike the deciduous forest we explored in the first episode, these forests are comprised mostly of conifer trees, descended from the evergreen trees of old, but convergently have evolved to look similar to the now extinct redwood trees. However, animals like wolves, bears, bobcats, and cougars have long since gone. They have been replaced by creatures we wouldn't recognize today. Nova Scotia, 80 million years from now. In the dense northern mountainous coniferous forest of Nova Scotia, unique species lurk in the underbrush. We've seen a snippet of this habitat from the first episode, but we mostly explored the deciduous forest. Animals like mono rats and mychopias are absent, while animals like coyotes and rabaroos still lurk in these forests. The woodland is far too dense for most larger animals, that's why most creatures found and here live in the trees. While there are deciduous trees in this forest, the conifers are much more common. This strange creature is the Gallosaurus, a descendant of the domestic chicken, and one of the most common animals in the coniferous forest. It resembles the extinct ostriches of the Anthropocene. They feed mostly on pine cones and nuts. They are quite important as seed dispersers. The top predator of these forests is the growler. It's a close relative of the bear fisher, but is descended from the pine marten. It resembles the extinct leopard or jaguar, but is a mustelid, and mainly hunts tree dwelling ah, Hey! Who threw that? It was a pink-headed monkey squirrel. It's part of a large family known as monkey squirrels. These squirrels look like primates, and behave like them, and they have something the growler lacks. Intelligence. With the same intellect as the now extinct orangutans of the Anthropocene, they're quite successful here. However, their cousins in Africa and South America are much more intelligent. The helmeted mammoth deer takes advantage of this. The squirrels throw pine cones and nuts at the predators, and in turn, the ones that they drop, the mammoth deer eats. Mammoth deer are actually some of the few ungulates still in existence right now. Their ancestors, the white-tailed deer, barely survived the mass extinction. Now animals like the mammoth deer and a few other ungulates are the only ones left. And to add insult to injury, competition from rodents practically ruined their diversity. Unlike the arctic piebald mammoth deer, they lack a trunk. In the pine forest, the helmeted mammoth deer are at home. Very few predators are willing to take them on. And since there's so much food, there's no really need for a trunk. Keyword, few. The growler is one of the most efficient predators in the coniferous forest. It resembles a jaguar, but is not related to them. The giant land isopod is almost reminiscent of the Carboniferous period isopods. It's one of the few creatures that the growler can't take down because its armor makes it hard to penetrate. The reason why they are so big is because of a higher oxygen content of the Earth. Insect and arthropod anatomy works as in, the bigger they are, the harder it is to gather oxygen. But no more, and with m more ferns to eat, they can get as big as they want.
eventually the morning sun finally rises. The hollow is still dark, however. This female named Dusty is curious, and she will be the next leader of the clan when she is, becomes an adult. As the flightless osprey patrol the trees, they also have to guard their own eggs. Their eggs are vulnerable. The plated skunk resembles the microdon we saw in the first episode. However, it is descended from the striped skunk. While this female is heavily armored with protective scales derived from hair like the microdon, their resemblance is due to convergence. Monkey squirrel scream at the intruder, scaring it off. But due to their screaming, they don't notice something. It attracts a predator. It was the leader! AKA Dusty's mother. Dusty has reached sexual maturity and is now assigned to forage. She's doing it at dawn, so the daylight creatures are just becoming active. Including the predators. And the catasaurs are some of the few true felids still in existence right now. This lone male just wants Dusty to leave his territory. He's not hungry, he just wants to be alone. In the pine forest, there are still a few deciduous trees, and these trees provide the herbivores with nuts. This strange creature is a pine parakeet. His ancestors lived in the Amazon. Once the rainforest became a savanna, they were forced to migrate to Canada. His large beak helps him crack open nuts and cones with ease. Dusty's foraging habits aren't very successful, only gaining a handful of fruits. This is a Leposaur, a small body relative of the Mychopia. <sighs> Once the most threatened group of animals, it seems like the age of amphibians has finally dawned. These colorful birds he is hunting are humming starlings, descendants of the invasive European starlings, and are now filling the niches of the long extinct hummingbirds. It seems like quite a dark and stormy night. But overall, most of the animals seem safe in their dense pine forest home. summer, wildfires spread throughout the forest, and they are quite deadly. What you are hearing are the cries of trapped forest animals. And Dusty is the only one of her group to survive. Due to this, well, she's the also the only one to notice. Her home is gone, forcing her into unknown territory. Normally it would be mating season, however Dusty is having a bit of trouble. 
she's been forced into the more mountainous area. But the fruit up in the trees are a good way to attract a mate. It's a male. AKA her new mate. One apex predator is the mountain stout. Near a nutrient rich lake. It's descended from the stout and it and while well, this lion-sized predator fills the niches of the now extinct mountain lions. As night falls near the lake, strange creatures arise to hunt. The torque. It lurks for prey. Despite its appearance, it isn't related to the now extinct badgers. It is a type of shrew. But the scientific name kind of gave it away. But like badgers, well, it's a carnivore, and a speedy one, too. The torque also uses its long claws for digging to create burrows and open fields. Camouflaged in the branches, the carnivorous night weasel lurks. And using its sharp teeth and pack hunting skills, they glide down and take down prey much larger than themselves. And finally, we have the click monk. It has poor eyesight, and it calls for a mate using clicks and whistles. Dusty has given birth to two pups in the tree hollow. However, they are blind and helpless, and it'll take four months for them to fully develop. But the tribe also needs unrelated males. That's why Dusty's mate has brought some friends with him. As one of Dusty's daughters forages for food, her mother has to teach her the way. This behavior isn't instinctive even if it can get them into trouble. Wild strawberries are actually quite common. They provide plenty of food for herbivores. While bear fishers usually don't do well in these forests, they usually group up for a special event, the annual migration of the salmon. Today, fishers, despite their name, don't even eat fish all that often. But after the mass extinction killed off all the bears, this niche was free for the fisher to take. Many salmon will make it upstream to lay their eggs, but many will also fall prey to the bear fishers. Despite it being aggressive, they won't attack when they aren't hungry, only attacking when territorial. The giant land isopod is perfectly armored and protected from the bear fisher. This male has come to lead his young. The young spend their lives in the water. This period lasts for about three months. Afterwards, they will crawl out of the water and onto dry land. The adults can live to be about 60 to 90 years old. Bear fishers, foraging is done. And eh, that's a shame. The signs of fall are starting to show. And during fall, many forest animals get hungry. While rabaroos are more common in the deciduous forest, they also thrive in the conifers during fall, led by a watcher.
Thankfully, there is safety in numbers, but the Kyoto is still fast. Against bear fishers, Rabaroos are defenseless. When they need to fight coyotes, they're lethal. Even a hungry coyote knows it's not a wise idea to fight back. Predators have lost this fight. The lake is shiny and filled with algae and water fleas. The sun provides food for plants, and the plants in turn provide food for insects. Poisonous and harmless arise to feed. These insects in turn attract small mammals and birds, which in turn attract the wood shrews, which in turn attract the carnivores. Food is rather scarce during November. Some animals are quite crafty, however. Using stone tools, the pine parakeets try to disrupt the ants so they can feed. But Dusty can use this to her advantage. A bear fisher? No, Dusty and her kind can just imitate noises really well. It's what her kind does to ward off a predator. While most monkey squirrels are herbivores, the brown monkey squirrels will feed on insects and carrion if available. A month later, and times are tough. In the conifers, winter lasts for a shorter season, but that doesn't mean times aren't tough. To avoid predators, the brown monkey squirrels are camouflaged very well in the red redwood trees. During winter, the plated skunks gather around. While solitary in summer, they are social in winter due to the fact that with less food, they need to group out to find more. The torque takes advantage of this. Its sharp teeth and vice-like jaws make the plated skunk's defense practically useless. In the winter, the food shortage makes it difficult for Dusty to find food. Just like that, she is killed, in the same way her mother was. Spring comes quickly, and the forest bounces back quickly as well. As spring arrives, the herbivores flourish. The mammoth deer graze beneath the conifers. Most of the young monkey squirrels have grown and are now going on to start their own families. And some mammoth deer come to drink near the river. A relic of a bygone era. Will he take it? 
Not today. Maybe not here. Maybe not with the species. But it will happen. One day. One day. episode, we shall explore the hot, arid deserts of Arizona. Explore how not all rodents have been restricted to herbivory, some of which have become some of the largest carnivores ever to live on the planet, and discover how even the most arid habitats somehow manage to support life. In life, he was the most fearsome beast ever to wander the desert. He ruled the Sand Supreme, his fierce aura following him wherever he went. This is the story of the last journey this giant ever made. Arizona, 80 million years from now. Arizona has stayed much of the same. It mainly suffered from a hole in the ozone layer, causing it to become unlivable, unless you were a small, hardy, adaptable rodent. Thankfully, after 40 million years, it recovered from the human era and cooled down. Due to the hotter environment, where there was once lush, lush forests, now there are nothing but barren deserts. The coyote are quite common. Their ancestors, the coyotes, were extremely adaptable in these deserts, due to the fact that they are quite common in the desert. However, unlike the temperate areas, they are scavengers in these deserts. It's strange. The order of Carnivoria has ruled the world as dominant predators for 140 million years. However, one animal dwarfs them all. He 
He is the Night Lurker, one of the largest rodents in this reborn Earth, and one of the few carnivorous rodents in existence right now. Large predatory rodents actually aren't very common. They were mostly outcompeted by true carnivorous. But during the mass extinction, the desert areas became too hot for true carnivorous. Thus, the world's first predatory rodent was born. It is the strongest and the most powerful. Despite his nature, his closest ancestor is actually the grasshopper mouse. With the absence of carnivorians, the grasshopper mouse eventually changed from an insectivore diet to a carnivore. And with an age of about 60 years old, this male's territory is this shiny soda lake. While he tolerates the coyote, he does not appreciate them. Life in the American desert is a constant challenge with the elements. The desert is actually a belt, separating the African continent and the temperate grasslands. The desert is extremely hot, and it stays that way year-round. Some animals have combated this by going underground. The sand devil is a descendant of the ferret, that after the absence of humans, evolved to thrive in the desert. They mainly hunt rodents, and gain most moisture it needs from their flesh. Usually the male night lurker would be hunting right now, but every year there is an interruption to this nomadic lifestyle. It will soon be time to find a mate. The mountain belt behind him is where the females lurk for most of the year. Thus he has two options. Call for a mate, or migrate the extremely long journey. The mating season for the Sand Devil is well underway. Their mating season is rather strange. It does not involve fighting nor calling. It involves a contest of who can growl the loudest. Unlike most modern species, the mating contests are held by the females rather than the lower ranking males. As with any competition, there are losers. Unable to find herself a good display patch. This female is perilously close to the soda lake. Here, she will be lucky to attract a male at all. Other males migrate to the mountain belt every year. That's where the females wait. This happens about every year when the creatures feel the instincts to move away. To avoid overcrowding, the male goes alone something common in his lifestyle, as he has the crown of the dominant male of his species for a long time. For this giant, it will be the last great journey he ever makes. The Desert Rabaroo is a relative of the Temperate Rabaroo. Unlike the Temperate variant, the Desert Rabaroo has no fur. To cool down, it needs direct air-to-skin contact. However, it still has predators. And with so many night lurkers traveling at the same time, food squabbles are quite common. The helmeted mammoth deer aren't used for, to the desert habitats. They use the desert as a temporary refuge during the winter, when the conifer forests are way too cold. Their hairless bodies and thick hides, however, are perfect for the desert. The only real problem is the lack of water. This strange creature is a hint of things to come. It's known as the Ornithifrog. It has small wings and is the first flying amphibian in existence. Suddenly they arrive at a halt. It's a cliffside. While the mountainside is still far away, this is the most perilous part yet. Our Night Lurker decides to go first.
While some night lurkers survive the fall, many are dead. Nobody is letting this go to waste, however. Cannibalism is very, very common. The mighty Roadrunner lurks only when night falls. It is a larger, much more defensive incarnation of the Roadrunner. However, but it's still not safe from the Kyoto, its principal predator. But even in these killing fields, life finds a way. The Microdon also lives in the desert. It actually lives here as opposed to the temperate regions during winter. It is small, but very hard to penetrate. And the Night Lurker, contrary to its name, is diurnal. The desert is simply too cold during the nighttime. They gallop, much like the extinct horses and zebras of Earth's past. In the blistering heat of midday, a monorat wanders through the desert. While the monorat species is native to the temperate woodlands up north, some wander throughout habitats. This old male has ended up here. It's a roadblock. The eyesight of a monorat is rather poor which means the climate of the desert, and its dusty wind, isn't a good environment for them. The monorat himself will now leave. Mud is really the only source of water that is drinkable in the desert areas. And the sand devils, which burrow into the thick mud, are a great source of food. This part of the journey is a food stop. In a food stop, they stop by the brine pools to catch small fish and other animals. One coyote has caught in a fish from the brine pool, and her success has not gone unnoticed by the male night lurker. The giant turned bully. The Night Lurkers have one major challenge, and this will be a particularly perilous part of the journey. The volcanic parts of the desert is where the temperatures are the hottest, and here, during the summer months, it is particularly hot. It is eerily similar to the mass extinction that is the reason that we are even here at this time. The only difference is that that one was at a global scale. And spookily, the lack of life means no decomposers. Due to that, there is no time to feed on the corpses. They stay there year-round. The group is not a herd, and thus has no social bonds. The next day, only a few individuals remain.
The Desert Crow, however, is extremely social and territorial. And one swipe could easily blind a Night Lurker. The Ornithifrog evolved from flying squirrel-like salamanders that lived in the trees millions of years ago, and the ones the Ornithifrog evolved from used to glide, but now they have developed fully powered flight. The largest Ornithifrog, the red-tipped Ornithifrog, may seem big, but it is still no bigger than a human. The Savagery and Brutality of Nature does not hide its beauty. Tragically, there is nobody to appreciate it. No painters, no artists, no photographers. Absolutely nobody. Just the endless fight for survival that will rage on for thousands of years to come. The mammoth deer may be unused to this ecosystem, but they are actually surprisingly well suited for the climate. But the predators are something the mammoth deer are not used to. The group missed but they are not going to give up like that. Nighttime, and with the mammoth deer's poor eyesight, it will be very difficult to see. And with just one night, the Night Lurkers have eaten their prey to the bone. A disappointment for scavengers. This place is a rain shadow desert. Other than Soto Oda Lakes and Oases, very little water dwells here due to the winds moving inland cool down as air is forced to move through the mountains. Finally, very close to the Night Lurkers destination. The hills themselves are very, very steep, but it is no challenge for the swift-footed Night Lurkers. The male Night Lurker we've been following already knows where he is going to be, right in the middle. However, the other males have a different agenda. Thus, he must leave. Here, in the shrubby outback area, he will be lucky to attract a female at all. Meanwhile, with a younger male, a larger female makes an approach. The males bow to show submission. Afterwards, the male will resume displaying in hopes of attracting more females. The female herself will now leave. Many days have passed and the males are finally beginning to leave. It is still fiercely hot. It is still fiercely hot. Not only has our Night Lurker been yet to mate, his instincts force him to keep trying. 
the worst of all, his experience under the blazing sun has all but killed him. The king of the desert has lost his majesty. His life has run full circle. In his time, he traveled the globe. But death finds him here, in the very same place where he first made it all those years ago. On the sands around him, others, males and females, lie lightly. The day he died never changed anything. He formerly was a majestic beast. Now he is just food for a group of lucky scavengers. This era is a golden period for giant carnivorous rodents. Sadly, it will be another few million years when true carnivorans take over the desert. That day will spell their doom. That wraps up Chapter 1. For Season 2, we shall journey to the African continent. And we shall start in the African of the grasslands. Witness the return of the mega -hunt. And discover the magic and wonder of this ancient, untouched land.